Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, still uh, Matt Schechner. I feel like you're a game show host. Uh, and it's my ongoing privilege to serve as the CEO of Advertising Week. Uh, and uh, we want as much time with Sir Martin as, and Kathleen as we can possibly have here in as little time as you can with me. Um, you'd so be stop, hard. Stop there. <laughs> right now. Finito. I think I have to listen to you. <laughs> Nothing need be said. <laughs> Sir Martin and Kathleen, okay, I'll take your cue. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Martin. Well, especially done for you, Kathleen. I know it was, and I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you so much. We're going to talk about lots of things today, particularly S4C, and we'll focus on that heavily. But yeah. I really thought it was important, given my background as a headhunter and a therapist, that we should know a little what bit more about tonight? you first. Are you, are you is, that, is that a question? Or, or a head, a head hunter? <laughs> I'm going to be mostly a therapist today, if oh, that's all right on. with you. Okay. you yeah. That's not what you briefed me on. You, oh. said, you said you were just going to do the head hunting bit. I'll, I'll start therapist, then turn into okay. head hunter. How's okay, that? Fine. Mr. Sir Martin Stuart Sorrell, born on Valentine's Day, yes. 1945. God's, God's biggest mistake. Oh, the much wanted, much treasured son of Jack and Sally. And it the was only Pittsburgh. son. Well, I had a brother well, who had died. A brother, yes. I had a brother who died one year before I was born, so I was the last chance saloon. So I was a oh. spoilt Jewish boy from northwest London. You said you were protected, spoilt, but they sacrificed much for you. Uh, they did. And my mother used to wrap everything up in plastic. I mean, Jewish. Immigrants, I think, well, they were the son, uh, son and daughter of Jewish immigrants. You, you sort of were were very grateful for what they had. So they used to wrap everything in plastic. Yeah. And it was amazing that I didn't end up wrapped in plastic in some <laughs> cupboard somewhere or some refrigerator. So you talk very fondly of your father, Jack. He was yes. an entrepreneur in in many ways. Well, himself. he wasn't. No, no, no. He wasn't. In entrepreneur. spirit. He was. He in was spirit. always employed. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the regrets of his life that he wasn't. Uh, he didn't start a business. He worked, uh, he ran what was equivalent to a sort of Circuit City or a Dixon's in its day. It was about, I think, 650, 700 red and electrical stores in the UK. And it was the retail division of an industrial holding company called Firth Cleveland, run by a guy called Sir Charles Hayward, and uh, who actually owned Wolverhampton Wanderers. So ah. as Wolves are doing so well, it, comes, it brings back uh, mem that. memories. Thing. But no, he, was, he never had his own business. He had to leave school when he was 13. He had a violin scholarship to the Royal School of Music, which he couldn't take up because he was one of five or six children who had to go out and become income earning yeah. units. Uh, it wasn't a time where you could, you know, you could stay at school. No, but they invested in your education. Uh, yes, he wanted me to go to Harrow, I remember. Um, there was a Jewish parents actually in North West London wanted all their kids to go to Harrow. <laughs> um, I suppose it was the nearest thing they thought to eat. And, um, and I didn't go to Harrow, I went to Haberdashers. Haberdashers, which many Westbier, people in the industry have been West to, West Westbier Road in Cricklewood and then on to Earl Street, yeah, yes. absolutely. And then you obviously go on to Cambridge. Yeah. But, Sir Martin, you get a Desmond. What I was going a, on Desmond there? Desmond Tutu, for those who don't know. Well, I got, I got a Tutu in the years when a Tutu really meant something. <laughs> with, with grade inflation, <laughs> that would be equivalent to an upper second, a 2-1, or maybe even a minor first, I would say. OK, I'll take that from you. And then you go on, but you go on to Harvard successfully. I go, yeah, well, I go to straight to Harvard, yes, yeah. at HBS. Yeah. OK. And um, clearly, so you're, you're 74 this year. 
Yes, and old, you're, old. You're, you're not at all, not at all in spirit from what I've experienced of you. Not in spirit. But not in spirit body, at yes. all. No, I'm not sure about that either. I said to you when I met you the other day, your skin is incredible, and you said it was your mother's yeah, this was skin. Yeah, this was really embarrassing. Yes, it's my mother's, <laughs> my mother's genetics. My mother's genetics. You've got great skin, and she, she was, she, she survived until she was 90 years old. Yes, we buried her on her 90th birthday. Oh, yes. Okay, understood. Now you have four so children. So I have my mother's genes. My father died, as we were talking before, in the green room when he was 74, and I'm 74 now. So you said. You know, was I worried about my mortality? I rely on my mother's genes. OK, well, we'll hang in there with that. You've got four children, so we've obviously got Mark, Jonathan and Robert from yes. your first Mark, marriage, which was Robert, 35 Jonathan, years. Jonathan, and that my right first wife, yes. Absolutely, but 35 years is a long time. I've never been brave enough to get married, so I congratulate you on that. And then happily married to Christiana for nearly nine years. Almost coming up to ten years, yes. That's yeah, right. OK, yeah. anniversary present at the ready. Uh, yes, yeah. April, okay. f April 5, yes. OK, coming up. And a gorgeous daughter that yes, you now have. Yes, two and a quarter years old Bianca, yes. And you were present for all the births, that's the I rumor. was, yes. I, I, I was always at the, um, the wrong end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was always surprised, you know, I always didn't want to know what the sex of the baby was, because I, I think is always the best way to do it, but yeah, that's I what I would recommend you. to anybody in the room who's contemplating it. You know, I agree just, with you. you, know, you get, it's a, a perfect surprise, but I mean, obviously, uh, momentous events. Absolutely so. Lover of films, music, cricket, I like, your yeah, I like film. I like cricket, I like skiing, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, known for responding to pretty much every email that's sent I to you. I have nothing else to do. Clearly. They, they, it could be robot, Martin. I mean, there are there is a story running around that I have robots uh, that, that answer. No, but it, the, the, the answer to is I think if... I mean, I think this is a serious point. If somebody calls you or somebody emails you, I think, you know, and has the interest to do that, I mean, you do get some, obviously, some spam. But if somebody does that, they take the trouble to do it. I think you, sh you owe them a response. And I, I, I'm going to say I loathe. That's probably putting it too strongly. But I do loathe people who don't respond. Yeah. Um, you know, there are people, in, I, I won't name them, but there are people in our industry who are notorious for that. Yeah, absolutely, uh, there are. I also hate the answer messages. I remember there was one guy at, um, it was a guy at uh, WPP who wrote, you know, the answer messages when you, when you send an email and there's an answer back. And this one said, I am at the, I'm on holiday, I'm at the bottom of an olive grove and I will not be able to respond for 24 hours or something. And, and I often, and I said to him, I said, look, if I was a client sending that, I mean, clients don't respect olive groves or holidays. Nope. Maybe they should, we can, we can argue that. But I thought it was, it's the most sort of um, impolite and uh, unthoughtful. Because we're in a service industry? Yes. Yeah. yeah because, okay. because and, and you know what? It, it's very pertinent to what S4 Capital is doing. Fast response, immediate response, and that's one of the reasons why I try and respond as quick. I mean, I don't. You know, sometimes I, I can't because I'm travelling or whatever it happens to be. But I think it's really important because I think that you know, if you said to me, "What is the thing in the last year?" It's actually not a year. It's the last six months mm -hmm. that I've heard from clients most. The frustration of chairmen, CEOs, CMOs, CTOs, CROs, CPOs, whatever you want to call them, it's lack of speed. Yeah. It's amazing. They all say their organizations are too slow. By the way, when they say that, and then you go back, and they're obviously giving directives inside the organization to move quickly, you go back and deal with their organizations, they're still very slow. Yeah. They, they don't. But that, that need for speed is... Uh, Absolutely critical. Yeah, we'll come on to that because clearly that's very much part of the way you've set up the new business. Yeah. So CEO of WPP from 1986 to 2008 made you the longest serving director of a FTSE 100 company. 2018. 18. Did I say 2006? A sorry, I made eight, that up. 2000. Eight, sorry, I lost uh, you 10 years. Yes, yeah, a, but, long, a long time. long time. But 91-92 was a very difficult time for the business, right? 91-92, uh, you know, I, I, I flubbed it with, with Ogilvy in the sense that I did this... Uh, with, with JWT, we did half debt and half equity, yeah. and then we found the property in, in, in Japan and that, you know, service of the debt and or yeah. expunged the debt. Yeah. With Ogilvy, I tried the same approach, which in 89, it was half debt and half convertible preferred. And those of you who are financially orientated will know that convertible preferred in a recession doesn't convert. I mean, the equity price has fallen, therefore there's no, there's no premium, uh, there's no advantage in converting. Uh, the convertible preferred, so I forgot that. And in those days, the, pr the, the coupon was, I think, 7.1... I think it was 7.1. 
and it was the same as gross and net. You couldn't tax deduct it. So actually, a 7.1 uh, coupon at a 50% tax rate was 14.2. So this was a whacking great burden on the business. And then in 91 and 92, we hit a recession. Yeah. And uh, so we had to re... Finance. We did a debt for equity swap mm -hmm. with the banks. I, I, you know, the J.P. Morgan building on the embankment is always. It's the City of London School yeah. um, Assembly Hall, and there's the headmaster's study, and there's all the plaques. So I was there this week at the J.P. Morgan conference, and um, that was that was where I got my bottom yeah, yeah. slapped um, for 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 miscuing on the fund on the funding. But you recovered and grew the business yes, to 24 I mean, billion listen, cap, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, we were at its height. And we were, you know, listen, I, I took responsibility for the, the mess that we got into. So, and I think which you always have to do. So, so we had to dig our way out. And we dug, we dug our way out very well uh, through the 90s, focused on organic growth in the 90s. And then by the year 2000, when we merged with... Um, y and r we were two thirds they were one third we we had two thirds of the board it effectively you know we we took y and r over but effect it, but it, but the 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 mechanism was a merger yeah what was the best day you ever had in that office the best day well they were they were all very good days i think the 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 most interesting day was the day that we um well we that we acquired j w t in nineteen eighty seven and um, I remember uh, two things about it. Firstly, um, arriving uh, in London Airport. So, so it was during the week. I, I, I should back up and say that I used to speak to my dad. Uh, Three or four times a day, right? Uh, more than that. I would say this is before mobile phones. I used to speak to him at least sort of five, six, seven times a day about the business. And, and I think, you know, talking about psychotherapy is a bit of a advice. You, you always need somebody that you can talk to who has your agenda, has no agenda, but your agenda at heart, who's, who's what. So I used to speak to him. After my father died, it was a lawyer in New York, Phil Reese, who fulfilled the same function up until, sadly, he died of cancer also in about 2002. But, but I was speaking to my dad, so I, I, would, I remember on the JWT, it lasted 13 days, mm. um, so-called hostile takeover, only hostile to the CEO, not hostile to the share, share owners, not hostile to the clients, and least of all to the people, because you want them to stay in place. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we, we cemented the deal late on a Thursday night, early Friday morning, and I flew to London on BA on the Friday night. It was a 747 jumbo, I think. I landed. There was a special services guy called Len Spooner, who was wonderful. And he came up with a copy of The Times, and we were on the front page of The Times. And um, Rupert Fall Walker, who's now a non-executive director of uh, S4 Capital, and was at uh, Samuel Montague and uh, Midland Bank at the time, was one of our advisors, had got a... He used to go to um, his home in the country. He used to live outside in, in Norfolk, I think, or Suffolk or somewhere. And on the train, there was a Times journalist. And he was, you know, sort of fed him... During the, the hostile... Uh, he fed him stuff, and he put it on the front page. And we had the wireworks, you know, the Dartford wireworks on the, on the front page and the back page of the, the Times. My parents could not believe it because um, they, they, you know, pre-war, pre-Second World War and post-Second World War, the Times was regarded as being pretty anti-Semitic. I mean, mm -hmm. in this Times of the Labour Party yeah. and Corbyn being supposedly being or re really being anti-Semitic, it sort of comes to mind. And they couldn't conceive that, you know, a little Jewish boy from northwest London would appear yeah. on the, the front page of the, uh, the Times. So if you ask about, you know, you know listen, the, the answer yeah. is there were tons of happy moments, you know, yeah. um, usually the more successful moments, not the, the more stressful moments. <laughs> but that was one that sticks, in, uh, sticks yeah. in my mind. Now, you told me you'll never retire, but you also had been reported to have said that you would I, never leave that job unless they I shot, shot you. you. Which they did, yeah. Uh, and I kind of feel that you mastered a bulletproof vest at somewhat in Farm Street I wasn't in wearing last a, I wasn't wearing a bulletproof vest. OK. The other advice I, I, would, I would give to anybody who's interested is choose your board carefully. I know, I've heard you say that before. But six weeks later, one of the only people I know at WPP that didn't have a non-compete clause. Yes, well, OK, so the history of that is really interesting. And I was interviewed by a French journalist from Le Mans just now, and I took him through it. So when I started at WPP, and this is one of the problems with the longevity, uh, you know, in, in, under the UK system now, it, a, a director on the board, it becomes um, non-independent 
on nine years and one day. So after nine years yeah. and one day, you lose your independent thought, which is complete nonsense. But anyway, so you don't have a view of history. So on this service contract, we're really interesting. Mm. So when I started with Gordon Sampson and the Wire and Plastics Board, we, I had a five-year evergreen contract. So every day it extended for five years. And after about two or three years, they came and said, Martin, this is not going to do. You know, the, the governance wonks. Mm -hmm. we're not, so it's got to be five years fixed. This is with non-competes, by yep. the way. So I said, fine. And then a few years later, they came and said, no, 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 it should be three. And I said, fine, we're again with non-competes. Mm -hmm. And then they came and said, two. And I said, fine. And then they came and said, one. And I said, look, enough is enough, right? It can stay at two, and we're having the non-competes, or why don't we go to at will, okay. which the board chose to do. Mm -hmm. okay. And I chose mm -hmm. to do. So that meant if I left, no payment. Mm -hmm. If they fired me, no payment. Yeah. That was it. So I read your email that you sent to the staff. I remember the weekend that I read it, and I, I actually felt quite emotional about it, being an entrepreneur myself, although yeah. be it a much smaller business, the sense of it being your baby. You've talked yes. about it being your baby. and But you also said in that email that you know, you're ready to travel back to the future, which I guess yes. is what today is about. But just quickly before we move on to S4C, this thing about it being your baby, I, I comprehend that, but just tell us a little bit more about well, what I think. Well, I think, you know, and I guess I sent this, said this to the Le Mans journalist. I said it probably ad nauseum. You know, somebody uh, starting a company is the nearest that I think a, uh, a man can come to having a baby without not the physical experience, the mental experience of it. So you give birth to uh, an idea. You know, I started with a guy called Preston Rubble, who was a stockbroker at Henderson Crossway. We were in a, a room of Noble Grossart and Lincoln's in film, uh, Fields. I think they still have the building. It's the, the top, the, bo the, the bottom right room. Yeah. There, were, there were three of us, and Robert Lerwell joined us, who was our CFO at that time, with three of us in a room. Uh, and then we moved to the basement. Uh, under the car park in Lincoln's Inn Field, and every time it rained, the, uh, the water used to come in. And I remember when we were negotiating with Bruce Wasserstein, the JWT deal, we were having these wonderful conference calls, and there were navvies sort of cementing the walls as water was cascading down into our room. Because we had a, actually, it was a very nice office, but it was underground, yep. it had no windows. Mm. And um, that was, those were beginning. But it's an emotional experience. You know, Wes uh, and Victor, who who run yeah. uh, Media Monks, uh, which is part of S4 Capital, started in a basement 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete Kim and Christopher Martin started uh, Mighty Hive six years ago after Pete left uh, Google. So th these are emotional experiences which, you know, founders, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, you sold 17% or whatever it was of the Gay Haynes business back back to them and you went off and started the Lighthouse Company. So you know exactly what it is. You start in a room, you have absolutely nothing yeah. other than an idea, which is what we did again mm. on May the 14th or what I did again on May the 14th of last year. And, you know, it's a very, it's a very taxing thing to do. I mean, it's challenging. It's sometimes frustrating. It's sometimes annoying. But I find it exhilarating. And this is my third sort of iteration. I was lucky enough to be with the Saatchi brothers by serendipity, actually, uh, with Saatchi's for nine years. I've had, I was lucky enough to be, what, 32 years with, with WPP. I don't know how long this will last. I've, I've said it, it'll last for a, a five to seven year cycle. And then if I'm compost mentis and if people are, think I should continue, then I might do another five to seven year stint, stint but you never know. You know what's going to happen. Absolutely so. So back to the future. Yeah. Tell us, obviously, I think lots of people are here today to really hear your view of what the future absolutely looks like for all of us to some degree. I know you have the better, faster, cheaper. I think you've nicked that from NASA, but you tell me that's no, the case. I, 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 actually, I met somebody <laughs> today who said it's cheaper, faster, better. And then, you know, a lot of people say, well, you're going to only have two of the three. I think you have all three, but we'll come back we'll to come that. We'll come back to it. Tell us so, about the future. So. When I left WPP, um, I looked at the WPP portfolio, and I, I you know, it's 20 billion. And there, there are two things. And I, funny enough, I did a podcast just before I came here at McKinsey in German Street, and the woman who took uh, me to the podcast, who suggested the idea, had written this article that I'm going to refer to. It's a McKinsey article which examined the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500, and it said, which of the com you know, so why are there companies that survive? Because the average life of a company now is probably about 16 or 17 years yeah. in the S&P or F mm -hmm. FT. And she an analysed it. You know, it's not unfortunately because of brilliant CEOs. That's not the key factor. It's not because of thank goodness cutting costs. Mm -hmm. It's because you find, you push on an open door, you find 
the segments of the industry where the top line growth is significant. Yep. So bearing that in mind, I did something very simple actually. I looked at the $20 billion portfolio at uh, WPP and I said, well, where is, where is the growth? And there were three areas there was growth. First party data, client owned data, first party data that others control. And it represented, if I looked at Kantar, which is now in the process of being sold, or so controlling interest being sold, um, if I looked at that, Kantar will panel, panel data, yep. uh, first party data, and Lightspeed. Not first party data, but access to it. There's some other bits of Kantar as well, but you know, if you said to me, you can have pieces of Kantar, that's what I, I, I would have. Second area was digital content, AKQA, Ajaz's agency, fantastic agency, VML, mm -hmm. John Cook's agency, really, really, really strong. Ogilvy One, yeah. if you could separate Ogilvy One, I mean, John Seifert's put it all together, which I think is the right thing to do, but maybe there's some executional issues that they're going through, but Ogilvy One. Uh, and Wonderman, yeah. you know, there's some old stuff in there, but there's, you know, a lot of good new stuff as well. So that, that's the second area, content. And then the final area is digital media planning and buying, otherwise known as programmatic. Two companies stick out, as far as I'm concerned, Zaxis, mm -hmm. Michelle de Rijk, who we, yeah. who, we, we, who joined us from, uh, from WPP in Asia, is running uh, S4 Capital Asia, Asia Pacific. And Zaxis, in essence, yeah. you know, Christian Jewel runs that, and it's a it's, it's a jewel. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great, great it's a great business. So those three areas. Yeah. Now linking them, you know, what WPP sort of taught me, I think, is S4 Capital's model is first party data, driving and fueling digital content, as you saw in the film, and driving the delivery of that through programmatic. Yeah. It's a loop, mm -hmm. and um, no longer I. You know, people in the audience may, may dis disagree, but no longer are, you know, are temp pole, what I call temp pole campaigns critical. I mean, I, the number of CEOs, I talked about speed, the number of CEOs and CMOs who said to me, we're not in the business now of making big films or big campaigns. Gone are the days when you could call the agency and say, oh, can we have a meeting next week? And then you go to the meeting and, you know, can we, have, can we develop a creative brief? And then after two weeks, the agency comes back and says the brief's not right or something or, you know, with, with a creative department, we, we can't handle it. it. It doesn't work anymore. So what you have to have in a 24-7, always-on environment is continuous, iterative process. It's like running... I know you've had political figures in, in Advertising Week. It's like running a political campaign but with no election date. Yeah. That's what it is. And it's an iterative process where you develop content, you test it, you, you send it out, you test it, you get the results and you develop the content. At, uh, at all. Yesterday on our call, you can go to our website and listen to our analyst call. It lasts an interminable two hours, but it might be worth dipping into. You know, we give some concrete examples, mm -hmm. you know, Ikea, Starbucks. I mean, it's some yeah. interesting examples where we produced assets at scale yeah. at very low cost per asset. Mm -hmm distributed them extremely effectively and gone in through that loop process. Yeah. So so that's the ho the holy trinity, as we call it, maybe ill-advisedly, of, of data, content, and media is absolutely critical, right? Yeah. Uh, we're a pure digital business. We're not going to monkey around with traditional stuff. So if the, if the ad market is $500 billion and the total with everything else that marketing services does is a trillion, but take the 500 billion, 200 billion of that stuff Mm -hmm. is digital. That's where we're focused. And that's, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon account for about 185 billion of that. Uh, Google about 125, Facebook about 50, 52, and Amazon about 10. At yeah. the moment. My view is that Amazon will go to 100. Mm -hmm. And Amazon will go on through the long tail. Yeah. They're not going to go for the big boys. They'll go for the big boys as well and big girls, but they're going to go for the, the, sh the, the long tail. And remember that Google and Facebook, 70%, 60%, 70% of their advertising revenues comes from the long tail. Sheryl Sandberg said at Davos and at DLD that Facebook has 91 million small businesses that promote their activities through Facebook. That's what Nick Clegg should be pushing as head of communication. Don't start me on Nick. Click. No, but it, it should be pushing because Facebook is an engine yeah. for small, just like Google, yeah. an engine for small business. So one of the regulatory counters must be 
that these platforms, just like Jack Ma, you know, when he promotes Alibaba, he talks about it being the way that Chinese small and medium-sized businesses are going to, to go forward. So purely digital, faster, better, cheaper. Mm -hmm. Faster means response because the speed is really important. Better means better use of technologies being agnostic. And cheaper, you know, whether we like it or enough, like it or not, cheaper, more efficiency. I know ZBB, zero-based budgeting, is sort of somewhat discredited, but the people running the ZBB companies, you know, Kraft Heinz, ABI, Coty, are very bright. Mm -hmm. They will course correct the model to focus on branding and innovation. And that's still going to be very, very important. And the last thing is unitary structure. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not doing earnouts. We're not going to do earnouts. I think they create too much fragmentation. I noticed I that. You've kind of, ways. rather than acquisition, you've kind of gone to buy in. And I've noticed well, that. Well, we talked about mergers. Yeah. And we talked about buy in. So the first sentence of any. So I had a conversation with some people last night. And I said, look, before we go any further, there's one question I want to ask you. And I asked Wesley and, and uh, Victor about this. I asked Pete and Chris about this. The first sentence if you want to sell your business, I'm not interested, period. Mm -hmm. I want to build long-term brands. You know, this, my dad used to say, you know, find a company and find an industry that you enjoy, find a company within it that you're fun. And if you fancy, you know, the age of 40, which is what I did, go out and start something on your own, fine. But he believed in long-term brand building. Mm. And of course, what the McKinsey article says is it's much more volatile now. Yeah. And maybe, maybe my approach is too ancient in the sense of, I believe in long-term brand building. I think that's the business that we're in, and I think we should practice what we preach. So what we're trying to do S4 Capital is build something with longevity. It's very challenging, it's, very, it's not easy to do, it's not easy to create a unitary brand, uh, but that I think is really important. The, the six holding companies, and indeed Accenture in my view, and Deloitte, are running into the same trap. <coughs> and that is you think you can buy a whole series of small businesses and you know just keep them separate you can't do that it's just it just doesn't work mm -hmm. um, effectively I mean after the earnout structure is a very good structure don't get me wrong you know a five-year earnout if if you implement it effectively if people inside your organization work on the conflict of people work on the conflict of clients get to know the business structure it and and you know bring it into the structure the vertical maybe that it's attached to and bring it in effectively but in human nature being what it is it is they don't and so i think it's better to do what we're doing at least we're experimenting with it we'll see whether it works or yeah. not so results were in yesterday from you so yeah. um 58 up year on year you've got clients P &G. top line top line yeah, yeah. png nestle mondelez on the profit <laughs> I, I saw 15.9 million profit on a pro forma basis, yes. is what it I means, saw. Yeah, without, you, without the acquisition costs yeah. that we had. You talked about whoppers and whales, that actually you'd like clients now that are spending at least sort of $20 million. Well, so we had $150 um, million of revenue and about uh, $30 million of EBITDA. This year, analysts are going for 225 organic. So 50% increase. We started January, we're up 50 on revenue and 30 on gross, mark, on gross profit. Uh, in January, so and and profit 45 million uh, EBITDA. So that's now of that 150 last year, the top two clients were 10 dollar 10 million dollars each. Mm -hmm. The 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 opportunity for us, and this is really important, uh, is to prove the concept. Mm -hmm. And the way we prove the concept is to deepen the relationships. Yeah. So uh, whoppers or whales, um, which would you prefer? Both um, <laughs> is is really getting traction, deep traction yeah. with the model. First and is that, is first that about party sort of fertilisation between these businesses as well? Well, you know, look, uh, without being specific, uh, one major package goods, we won, uh, we won a big assignment for us, which is small for anybody in the audience, but big for us. Um, you know, that was a media monks and immediately the client said, show us what you can do on programmatic. Mm -hmm. um, happened in with a, uh, that was packaged goods pharmaceutical client exactly the same so we are getting tremendous um, inbound interest actually and outbound stimulating uh, stimulating it outbound as well between content and media and, and the irony about this is that we're talk about back to the future we're going back to the 1990s 
I mean, instead of separating media, you remember what we, we did? I mean, I was there at WPP and everybody thinks they said, they said that I forced Mindshare. I didn't force Mindshare. Shelley Lazarus, who was running Ogilvy, and Chris Jones, who was running JWT, were so appalled eventually by the losses that they had of media because the media people were treated like first, second class citizens. You know, the, the first class citizens were the Don Drapers or the equivalents. And you know, if you go back to Mad Men, it's really interesting. Mad Men actually predicted, well, actually, they covered. Remember, the creative lounge was turned into an IBM mainframe. Mm -hmm. And you remember the media, he wasn't called media director, he was media manager. He wasn't on the board, he complained he wasn't on the board. And he said, you know, when McCann's took a controlling interest in Sterling Draper, he said to, to I think, Roger Sterling, he said, uh, do you know they've got six data analysts or four data analysts? So actually, it predicted the future. Yeah. But we were, they were treated like second-class citizens. What we're doing is reuniting, ironically, yeah. we're reuniting digital creative mm -hmm. with media. Yeah. And creating, you know, people use the word seamless, uh, too easily. It isn't, it isn't easy to do that, but we're recreating the model. Yeah. So you talked about going from peanut to coconut and now torpedoes. I'm wondering what might come after well, that, but you've we, talked about we, We've acquiring... talked about acorns as well and oak trees. <laughs> we've, talked about, we've talked about peanuts. And some people have peanut allergies, we said, uh, going to coconuts. And then there's a, a coconut called the coco de mer, which is a double chambered coconut, which is a okay. bigger coconut. So maybe we're getting Going for that. You talked about acquiring in the results yesterday a content agency potentially in Europe and a digital buying firm in LATAM. Yes. So, so these are uh, unkindly called infill acquisitions, which they're not infill. It just seemed a little bit unkind, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is unkind. Uh, so they're, but Although they're, I'd be happily been an infill deal. No, it's horrible. If Lighthouse, uh, you know. But it's really, it's companies that we can, we can you know, bring into the group through our internal cash flow. The, the cash flow in the business last year was very strong. We, we took out a, a loan of 50 million, just under 50 million pounds for uh, Media Monks, and we'd reduced that by the year end to 20 million and had done consistently so. So the cash flow is very strong. It's 100% profit conversion to cash. So it's really, it's a, it's a great business. Um, I, obviously, small scale. So there are some things that we can do the limits on our on debt we've set at twice EBITDA. So if we did 45 million this year dollars, we'd be 90 million would be yeah. the, the maximum debt that we would take on. The market cap is 600 million dollars, yeah. so we're, we're pleased with that. So we've got some traction. Um, you know, I'd like to get the market cap to about a billion dollars, and then I'd like to sort of sit and wait because I think 2019 is going to be an extremely. It's already been a bumpy year. Mm. Uh, we're one quarter through it, basically. I think the rest of the year is going to be pretty bumpy, too. At what point does scale start to inhibit what your vision currently uh, is? Look, they, people ask me what's it like uh, you know, going from you know, uh, a hero to zero. Um, <laughs> Who dared and, to ask and, me that? And, and, you know, so May the 14th, I'm sitting there you know, uh, with, a, with an idea on a piece of paper, sort of, not even a piece of paper in my mind. And the answer is, you know, the good news is it's a clean, clean sheet of paper. The bad news is a clean sheet of paper. Good news is I'm not weighed down by history, of which, you know, I would have to take partial, if not total, responsibility. Yep. Um, so I'm not weighed down by legacy analog businesses. You know, I can, you know, I pick the three areas. Let's go for those three areas. Um, the bad news is I don't have the scale. Now, it's interesting. We're in 16 countries. We have 1,200 people. Um, yeah, we've had some negotiations, discussions with major package goods companies, and we're talking about 100 billion plus companies, which are significant factors. And when we talk about the network we have, it is sufficient. Mm -hmm. It is not insufficient. Uh, you saw there on the film, you know, we, we would add something in France and Korea and Italy. Uh, you know, we're already into Japan. We opened up, already opened up in India. So we're in 16 countries. I think probably going to about 20, 21 countries. You know, you think about France, Italy, Spain, Germany, that would take us to, to 20, Korea, 21. So I think that's probably, you know, Africa, we, we don't have representation in Africa. We have it in the Middle East, in Dubai. 
I think maybe South Africa. I'm a bull on South Africa yeah. with Ramaphosa and everything. So advertising week's going there next year. Watch well, out. It's good. No, Matt Shecknell will be after you. Yeah, it's good. It's it's good good timing because I think the country will change uh, for the better. I mean, obviously challenges. Africa is very difficult. It's 57 countries, I think it is, and it's very volatile. On a micro level, you find great companies there. Mm -hmm. On a macro level, it's very difficult to operate because it, the bumpiness. You know, Nigeria. In theory, 200 million people should be fantastic, but the corruption, you know, all apologies to anybody in the audi audience who's offended by it, but the corruption, and there's corruption pretty much everywhere, but Nigeria uh, is a really tough market. Egypt, we, we at WPP had a very good business in Egypt, 90 million people. Those are the two biggest markets, and I think, um, you know, really interesting opportunities. Yeah. Understood. We're getting some questions coming in. Are you happy okay. to take some questions? Fine. Yeah. Um, OK. As long um, as they're not too difficult. They're not difficult at all, but I'm going to try and avoid too much of WPP, but let's see. Uh, Non-disclosure agreements have come under scrutiny. Do you think they should be used, whether they cover up or... Uh, whether, <laughs> whether they cover up wrongdoings or not? Well, listen, look, let's be quite clear about this. You know, the, I think the board of WPP have finally come to their senses. You, you may have noticed that there was an investigation. That investigation found nothing material, their press release, not mine, uh, and that I left as a good lever. And last week, they finally agreed to pay up the, the incentive agreements, you know, as with it. So, you know, whether NDA is a, a right or wrong, you know, you look at the own case, that's, those are the facts. So, yep. you pay your money, it takes you, make your choice. Looking back, is there anything you'd have done differently with WPP? Not had the, not had the convertible preferred for Ogilvy. Um, <laughs> that would be about the that only thing I like would admit that I would admit publicly to. OK, I've got you. I'll come to some others in just a second. Um, we were saying when we spoke the other day, it's Martin, that a lot of people that are born around the last couple of decades, certainly some of our children, yeah. may live to 100 years life expectancy. If that were to be the case for you, what are you going to do with that time? Well, I'll carry, listen, I, I, the, the comment about, you know, I'll, I'll carry on doing it until I get shot was it was not a physical shot, it was a metaphorical one. Um, and, you know, I, I believe, you know, people I've seen who've retired tend to vegetate. Mm -hmm. um, What's your saying? You have a saying about that. There's, you know, something, something about if you stop or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but essentially what... What it says stop is... Stop when you the die and you die when you stop or something. Yeah, something something yeah. along those lines. But it, essentially, I think it's important to keep mentally um, engaged. And I don't like portfolio things. I mean, I don't want to dabble in three or four things. I want something that I can focus on, yeah. rightly or wrongly, and something that keeps me engaged. I can't... Flitting from flower to flower is not something that I would I heard enjoy. your wife say that she can't imagine you sorting out the knives and forks in the kitchen no. drawer. Or, or putting in a light bulb or anything of that nature or changing a plug or a puncture. I was teasing like, yes. Sir Martin because he said on, a, on Desert Island Disc, and if you haven't heard it, you should because it's very wonderful, he said um, that he can't change a light bulb and I said, now you have a two-year-old daughter, surely she might need a puncture fixed and you said, no, my wife will do that for no, me. she will do that. <laughs> so, I mean, that question in there about... The Brexit is mantra of clients yeah. want to take back control. That's really uh, important, I think. I, I mean, I think what's happening, it's a strange parallel, maybe, but you remember that, that, that Dominic Cumberpatch, or is it Dominic Cummings, who ran the, the Brexit campaign, uh, his tagline was take back control. And I think that's happening with our clients. So, and for two reasons. Firstly, is since 2008, since Lehman, the world has been a place which is growing more slowly. So, so GDP growth has been about 2 or 3%. Prior to Lehman, prior to 2008, it was about 3 or 4%. The basic reason being that inflation was not under control pre-Lehman, it's been much more under control post-Lehman. And that's meant that clients have had very limited pricing power, which means they focus on cost and they reduce their resources. Now, you know, sort of fast forward to 2016, which is when I think it really started to bite, or 2017, the walled gardens, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, because the Chinese are just as worried about the, the, the data issue as the West, yeah. the walled gardens have started to grow, if that's right. I mean, they've got, they've got bigger. The reason being, whether it's uh, brand safety, privacy, interference in elections, fake news, whatever it is, the regulatory pressure on the platforms has got greater. And whether, you know, it's a fig leaf or not, I don't think it is a fig leaf. They've genuinely said, 
we're, we're going to control the data yeah. and we're going to stop dissemination of the data. The clients saw the internet come along and thought, thought well, we can have direct relationships for the first time with the consumer. You know, Tesco, Walmart, Carrefour are not going to stop us anymore. Then the e-tailers have come along, like Amazon and Facebook and Google, and the base, or certainly Google and, and Amazon and Tencent and Alibaba, and have stopped the dissemination of data. So the battleground is over yeah. data and the direct consumer relationship. Clients in this environment said, we want to take back control. Mm -hmm. Unilever buys Dollar yeah. Shave Club. Coke buys Costa. Nestle buys Starbucks. These are all examples of where direct-to-consumer activity is becoming more and more important. Data drives it. Mm -hmm. So there are several clients that we've seen who've taken the Holy Trinity model yeah. and are embedding it in their organization. Mm -hmm. You know, they're starting with the first party data they have and they're deploying it to content and they're deploying it to media. So I think the take back control thing yeah. is really important. And there's a strange analogy to our attitude to Brussels as well. OK, uh, I'll take a couple more. So uh, what and how do you want it to do you want S4C to be perceived as and how do you see it being positioned to stand in for the future? Just well, it, you, you know, the, the four principles are, yeah. are there. I mean, purely digital, focused on on growth. And and I want, you know, I want to, to prove the model. Mm -hmm. So at scale, yeah, because uh, as I said, you know, I want the whoppers and the whales. And so um, what do I mean by that? I mean, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars instead of 10 million, because that for a company with 150 or 225 million dollars of revenue is, is yeah. very significant. You said yesterday the company is going to focus on recruiting talent. Are you a fan of headhunters, Sir Martin? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm a, I, listen, I think, without wanting to be offensive, I, I, I think <laughs> that anybody in our business, and I really feel passionately about this, you know, what tended to happen it's not, I think, in the, the top six, the six biggest holding companies, was that, that HR got sort of segmented. Anybody running an agency should know who are the people yeah. that they would recruit. They should have a running list. Absolutely. Right? The, the top six yeah. people for The whoppers six and the whales they'd like to get if they could. It, uh, people. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and the, the reason I highlighted it in the, the release is there's so much turbulence in our business, for good reason or bad reason. Uh, and when I referred to turbulence in 2019, I, I think we're on the... You know, I was talking to one fund manager today because we were doing, starting to do our roadshows post-results, and he said to me, the trouble with zero interest rates is they hide the zombie companies. He referred to them as the zombie companies. And you know, when low interest rates do, they, they enable companies to carry on for longer than they possibly should do. And if in interest rates re re return to a more normal level, it, it might sort out the wheat from, from the chaff. But I, I really think on the people front, I mean, the biggest investment that we make, so a, a little S4 capital, you know, out of 150, 70% of our revenues is invested in people. At WPP, the investment was $12 billion out of 20 billion. We, we mismanage that budget atroci atrociously. Mm -hmm. That investment in people, we did. When, when people used to say to me, you know, well, we need more resources, I would say, look, we've got 12 billion there that we're investing. Yeah. And I use the word investing. It's not a cost, it's an investment. Let's invest that much more wisely <laughs> and, and much more carefully. Mm -hmm. You know, we spent more time worrying about the 750 million that we were investing on capital equipment. Yeah you know, on computers and everything than we did on the top in it, which is a nonsense because the business is about people and the quality of the people. OK, quick fire to finish. We're out of time. Yeah. Uh, Favourite dinner party guest, Charles Sarchi or Bill Muirhead? Charles Sarchi. Uh, Favourite city, London or Rome? Both. I have can't, to pass. You can't have both. Diplomatic. <laughs> uh, Your wife well, London, something to I, say. My wife prefers Rome and I prefer London. OK. Crisps or chocolate? Sorry? Crisps or chocolate? Chocolate. iPhone or Blackberry? iPhone. Really, I miss my BlackBerry. Yeah. Theresa or Trump? Well, is, how did they bungle the BlackBerry? I Do you mean, remember so. the day it went down? I thought something yeah, had terribly gone wrong and it had. Absolutely horrendous. And they didn't produce anything of equal quality. That's yeah. sad. What's next? Theresa or Trump? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Red or white? Red. Snow or sun? S snow. Bath or shower? Shower. Facebook or Google? Sorry? Facebook or Google? Well, what are we saying? Uh, we say like... <laughs>
What are we saying? Facebook or Google? No, the answer, I've got to be diplomatic, both. You can't have both to the last one. OK, Google. Love or money? <laughs> both. <laughs> so, Martin, we wish you the very best Thank of you luck very much. for showing Thank us you. the Thank Back you. to the Future Thank way. You. Thank, Thank you. you.